Hi there, it's Alexandra from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and I have been visiting two private gardens that I think have got some great tips for all of us. Both of these gardens are in southern Australia but it is a temperate climate. The summers are generally hotter than we would find in southeast England but they do have frost and snow in the winter although often for not very long. Many of the plants here would grow well in a cooler climate and some of the ideas also would simply translate they're not weather dependent. The first garden I'm visiting belongs to Dale Simpson and John Hazelton, and it was designed in 1994 by the well-known designer Grant Saltmarsh and it has been beautifully maintained by both its owners since. John and Dale have had it for around five years and they've now started opening it again for Open Gardens Victoria and they've really taken Grant Saltmarsh's design on and moved it on to really another level. It's a delightful garden to walk round. At the beginning of the garden you walk in via a path to a sort of Mediterranean area and this is where there are lots of plants like succulents and aeoniums and sedums and stone crops and yucca and agave and it's very much a dry landscape. Now a lot of these plants, succulents for example, will actually survive down to minus 20 degrees and that's either Celsius or Fahrenheit because it's sort of about the same at that level. Um, and you, so you would just have to check whether you could grow them. But I think it's also one of the things that you can get from this Mediterranean garden is that if you get one kind of plant and you really kind of focus on that one style or kind of planting, it can work really, really well. And of course, succulents often will survive the winter. One thing they don't like is too much wet. Now, if you're finding, as I am, that our summers are getting drier and drier, then perhaps this sort of Mediterranean style planting could be something to really think about. There's a lovely sunken garden, where, which is surrounded by aeoniums, yuccas, agaves, lovely, lovely plants here. And this is just a very sheltered area. This area is sheltered with a hedge on one side and the terrace building on the other where they've got chairs and tables. So it's very sheltered but it gets a good amount of sun from overhead. And one of the lovely things that Dale has done is to tuck little succulents into things like rock banks or at the bottom of a post. And he's just put one or two plants in there and then he's let them spread. And in very dry times, he sprays them with a bit of a spritz of water, but otherwise they just sort of look after themselves. And it's really lovely to see a little surprise just where you might not have expected it. So that I think is another thing that one could think about doing in one's own garden. Dale and John's garden ornaments or garden sculpture are also slightly themed. They have a lot of bird sculptures. Now, because their garden is over an acre, they've got quite a lot of space. They could easily have lots of different sculptures. But if you are in a much smaller area, theming your sculpture or your garden ornaments really does help to make it feel much more considered and much less random. And of course, bird sculptures are a most wonderful thing for a garden because they feel so natural. And I just love these little hens walking along this path like this. There's another bird at a, overhanging the pond. And there are bird sculptures tucked around the garden everywhere. And I think the idea of theming your garden ornaments is another idea that could translate to any garden. Round one side of the garden, in quite a small area, Dale and John have planted a number of maple trees. I counted about 15 or 20 young maples and quite a lot of different varieties. And this will grow up into a maple grove and it's really not in a large area. This is something you could do in a much smaller garden. And one of the huge strengths of having something like a grove of trees rather than just one or two trees is that you could get a wonderful amount of privacy from it. If you've got a lot of houses overlooking your garden and you put a grove of trees in the middle of your garden as opposed to around the edge, you will actually get quite a lot of privacy. You'll get this beautiful tree leaf colour in autumn. You provide a habitat for wildlife. You improve air quality. It's just a lovely thing to do in a garden. So it's worth thinking not, shall I plant one tree, but shall I plant a group of trees? Shall I get to know an entire genus of trees? And looking at Grant Saltmarsh's design, he has done these beautiful curved beds opening out into the lawn. In the last decade, there's been a lot of geometric 
rectilinear design in gardens and I think that's had a lot to do with the fact that gardens are getting so much smaller because there's no doubt that curves are much harder in a very small garden because they can create little sort of pinch points where it's difficult to plant something but curves do look beautiful and they are natural and they lead the eye very naturally and I think seeing how the shrubs and the borders work in Dale and John's garden really means it's worth thinking Shall I have straight borders or shall I have curved borders? And of course, the decision is a question of what's right for you and what's right for your garden rather than any particular fashion. But I think it's really worth, if you've got a bit of extra width in your garden, I think it's worth thinking about perhaps having a curved border. This garden is called Nandy. It's in Australia, in near Melbourne. But the ideas that I'm going to share with you would work wherever your climate and wherever you're based. What you can see behind me is that Nandy's owner has built a greenhouse out of leftover pieces of glass, of window, of shower door, of all kinds of things like that. And he said to me that he had not spent a single dollar on the materials for the greenhouse. He accepts that he's quite a practical person. He's not a builder or anything like that. He did say he's worked in an office all his life, but he did grow up on a farm. And so he simply uh, worked out how to do it himself. But what really made the difference is that they had a builder on site at the moment doing some other work. And so the builder put in just the framework. That's the four uprights on the corner and the frame for the roof. And those were sunk into the ground, obviously with a concrete post mix. And once you've got a really secure frame, then hanging other windows and doors on it is much easier. Perhaps one of the things to notice about this greenhouse is that each of the individual windows and panes are quite large. I photographed a salvaged greenhouse made from lots and lots of windows in the City of London a few years ago and actually the trouble was that some of the windows were just so small and there was too much in the way of frame, the proportion of frame to actually window glass was wrong and it meant that there was very slatted light and you couldn't really grow seedlings in there quite as well. It looked fabulous but it didn't actually work as well whereas this particular greenhouse has actually got windows made from really quite large pieces of glass almost all quite large pieces of glass he really liked the sort of traditional English greenhouses that have those little uh, black and white square floors and so he bought these tiles which are the closest he could get to it which I think looks very good and to, add, and to add a special touch to the greenhouse, he's added an antique chandelier, which he had anyway, and just gives that kind of air that this could have been a greenhouse that's been here for ages, maybe used for storage, but in fact, it is less than five years old. The other thing I really like about the Nandy Garden is that when the owners bought it five years ago, it was terribly overgrown and it had trees and shrubs that had been there for, in many cases, nearly a hundred years. And the temptation with this, they were very, they made the house dark, uh, obviously they made all the beds dark. And I think the temptation for many people would have been to just simply get in the diggers and just remove all the trees and shrubs or most of the trees and shrubs and to start again. But Nandy's owner has really worked to trim the trees and to lift their crowns and to expose their trunks and to create much more light both for the house and for the garden beds near or beneath the trees and so he's managed to hang on to these wonderful beautiful old trees which of course have fabulous bark and they're almost like sculpture the way their their branches twist round and I think that's a terrific lesson for anyone who moves into a house and just think, oh my God, these trees, these shrubs, they've gone right over where they should do. And of course, they usually have. It, something has to be done. But I think that simply to look at clearing the lower branches, which are often the oldest and the deadest anyway, is a very good idea. And you can see there's an actual thicket of trees and shrubs, which must have been just a, a great mound of, of foliage. And by trimming away all the lower branches, they've opened it up and it's become like a sort of secret glade. Another thing I really rather like about this garden is that the vegetable garden has been become a little kind of garden of itself. And it's, it's right in front of the back of the house. You can see the vegetable garden from the deck where they sit and have a, a meal or drink. So it's not being hidden away, but it is surrounded by a very low fence. And then there's a little gate. And that, of course, is really an anti-critters thing. But we in Britain have uh, rabbits and voles and 
deer and things like that. I'm lucky I don't because I have a walled garden in town. Uh, but just a, having your vegetable garden is a really pretty little fenced off enclosure right in the middle of the garden where it's sunny is I think a really lovely idea and he surrounded the outsides of it with roses which just looks so pretty. If you really enjoy seeing round private gardens, I've got a private gardens playlist here, which has got some of the private gardens I've seen in London and around the world, and they've all got tips and ideas that you could translate to your garden. So don't miss that. And if you've enjoyed this, please do hit like, because then I know you'd like to see more design ideas from private gardens. And if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your middle-sized garden, then do subscribe to the Middle-Sized Garden on YouTube. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.